told CNBC.com, I believe, back at the end of April that there was a tidal wave of Chinese IPOs coming to the U.S. A lot has happened since then. How does it look right now? Uh, well, the tide is definitely receding. Um, we had a few uh, IPOs get out the door, of course, but I, I think in the near term, uh, the, the possibility of anyone, any Chinese company doing an IPO uh, or a SPAC even is pretty remote just because of the uncertainty valuations, uh, the heightened risk awareness. So, ha so have the clients that you advise reconsidered and, and scrapped their plans altogether? And if so, where are they listing? Or are they just sort of waiting until this dies down? Well, there's always an initial period of waiting. Uh, most of the reconsideration is really going towards whether to list in Hong Kong or whether to list in Shanghai. And that was really the lesson that came out of Didi. Uh, Didi, um, as we know, really faced a public reprimand for uh, ignoring their regulators and the government authorities and deciding to list anyway, even after they were advised not to. So, uh, you know, there's a, what's happening there is very much specific to Didi and their behavior. What we're seeing more recently now, you know, all these education names that are getting uh, getting whacked is a completely different phenomenon. And uh, even though that's the case, obviously the general fear level goes up when uh, there's a heightened level of regulatory uncertainty. Uh, Gary, we did get a downgrade of uh, DD out of uh, a group today, uh, although they kept their overweights on BABA and Tencent and Atlantic Equity said risks appear manageable and both could benefit from any near term cooling in competitive intensity. I wonder when you think that comes, that period of cooling, because doesn't it seem like any large Chinese giant has gotten the message by now? Well, yeah, that's exactly the case, right? So the issue with DD is they're really a national champion. And uh, I, I was actually on uh, the closing bell a couple of weeks ago when that first happened. And, and the key point I made then was, if you looked at the American national champions, what if, what if Apple and all the fangs, all these companies were traded in Hong Kong, none were traded in the U.S., you know, you'd start to scratch your head and say, wait a minute, there, there's a problem here. And, you know, the Chinese government and frankly, the Chinese people kind of see that the same way. Uh, you know, Didi is a national champion. They're very important. The, the average man would love to participate in that wealth creation, but when it's traded in the U.S., you can't. And so, uh, I, I think they're at the national champion level. Uh, there, and, and obviously, the ones we we know were coming up, like ByteDance, are really. I think they've gotten the message. They're not going to listen in the U.S. They're going to look at Hong Kong or perhaps Shanghai. Uh, the the big question mark is sort of that great middle ground. Companies that are successful, they're in technology sector, whatever it is. It may make sense for them to list in the U.S but they're in the gray area. Like, should they do it, should they not? It depends on, uh, a lot of times it'll depend on uh, uh, what's ha happening, uh, you know, right in that window that they wanted to list. And right now, obviously, the window is shut tight. So what does that mean for the companies that have already gone through with it, like Ababa or Baidu, you know, that have ADRs that trade here in the U.S.? How susceptible do you think they are to more pressure? And, and do you think China could take it as far as getting them to delist? Well, you know, it's interesting because a year and a half ago, it was whether the Americans would force them to delist. No one is really talking about that now, although that will, the whole accounting issue is going to come back onto the radar screen next year. Uh, I think, I don't think the Chinese government would force uh, the national champions like Alibaba to delist, but certainly they're going to encourage uh, dual listing, right? So uh, some of the big names that are listed in the U.S. have already done that. So Yum China is now listed in Hong Kong. CTO Express, big delivery company, traded in New York and Hong Kong. And I think that's going to be the near term, uh, a gradual move to, to, I guess, share in the, uh, in, you know, in, in the wealth creation, uh, in the visibility, uh, and to really reaffirm, you know, from China's perspective that Hong Kong and Shanghai should be the preeminent uh, listing places for Chinese companies. We had a conversation this morning with uh, John Chambers, chair and emeritus of uh, Cisco, who said right. he's not advising his startups to do business in China and he's not invested in any Chinese startups. He thought that this period would get bumpier before it got better. Do you share that view? Uh, I don't know. So, uh, and I did see the interview. Uh, I, I would not shy away uh, as a venture capitalist operating in China. I certainly wouldn't shy away from uh, investing in startups. The, the, the market in China for young companies with great new ideas 
is, is actually quite fertile. I mean, it's a fantastic market. There's a growing middle class. So all of the investments, um, uh, benefits you could have from starting a, a business in China are still there. The VC always thinks about exits, right? And so, uh, yes, true, uh, you know, looking out three, four, five years, will a U.S. exit still be possible? You know, who knows? But uh, Hong Kong exit, Shanghai, m and uh, there's still plenty of ways to monetize the VC investment. So I, I, I wouldn't agree with that, that sense that, you know, the, the startup opportunities in China for, again, for foreign investors uh, or anyone are really uh, uh, diminished in any way. Shepard Smith here. Thanks for watching CNBC on YouTube.